welcome back to Geeks and Grounds, a monthly game club and weekly podcast where we play games and brew good conversation. I'm your host, Jenny Windham. And I'm Joel Thomas. And uh, we have been playing a lot of games this past week. A lot of games. I, lot the of most games. games I've played in, well, how long has it been since the last Next Fest? <laughs> exactly. I know it's like once a quarter, we have a week where we dedicate time to just playing as many titles as possible. Um and this week, we're going to be doing something a little different. So instead of continuing a discussion of a longer game that we have been playing together as community, this week we took time to say, hey, we have finished playing Signalis for the most part. I know some people are posting about how they're still working through it, and that's awesome. Um, but today, we're going to be discussing games that we played over the last Steam Next Fest and highlight some of the ones that we tried and we suggested from last week, see if they turned out to be as you know, as good as we'd hoped, um, and also highlight some of the ones that surprised us that we thought were really great. Um, but I first wanted to stop by the Pastry Case before we get into the Steam Next Fest stuff. Um, Pastry Case is our grab bag of topics, and today we're just going to use it to go over things that we've been playing and engaging with that were not Steam Next Fest related. Um, Joel, what have you been up to? You know, it's been a good week for a Joel. There's been a lot of favorite things that have uh, come to come to light. Mm -hmm. uh, so one, I, I actually resurrected a show that I hadn't watched in a while. There was like a three part series on Netflix called Middle Ditch and Schwartz, which is like a just a two person improv comedy thing. It stars the guy that played John Ralphio in Parks and Rec. Uh, doing like an hour long improv show. And it's like three, three shows. I haven't watched this in years. And I was just like in stitches, absolute joy. Like if you guys are looking for something that's like not a committed sitcom situation, would yeah. highly recommend that. Um, I don't know. I've just been like, I've, I feel like improv live is kind of hit or miss for me. But for whatever mm. reason, these like improv as a like, more refined thing that we're seeing in media today has really been feeding me nice uh also uh the bleach 1000 year blood war uh is back the new season is is out uh so we've got a couple episodes and you know if you liked bleach back in the day but felt like it was just way too long with too much filler there is no more filler uh in this series it's all just like straight to the action incredible animation you know the the outfits of these characters are always on point so what what is not to love uh absolutely feeding me there that's awesome <laughs> and then i uh, i listened to my friend jenny and i tried out uh, a little game called metaphor re fantasio uh <laughs> and you were absolutely right this game like I don't know. I maybe played like two hours or so of it. Uh, and just the storyline, I am so intrigued in. I have mm -hmm. not figured out the combat yet. I am basically just running away from everything that I encounter. Oh, no. <laughs> um, but like, I don't know. There's something about it that's just very like, um, I feel hopeful at this stage of the game. Like it starts mm. off brutal, but like the character that I'm playing, like, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm very much enjoying it. Have you been getting further into that? Yes, I have. I still really like it. I think it's one of those games where I feel like the like one hundred percent the music is the is the thing that has carried it for me. Mm -hmm. Like the characters, I think I'm still early enough where I'm like the characters feel quite bland. Um, I don't dislike them, but I also am like these feel very generic <laughs> anime to me. But the music, the monster design, and I think some of the intrigue in the sort of overarching like political tack that this mm -hmm. game is taking, I think is really cool. And even though I think for people who are maybe more familiar with some of the themes, it can feel maybe like diversity 101, like, oh, we should be fighting for a more equitable society. It's like, okay. But I think that actually is great. I feel mm. like not enough games even have that as a bar. And so like this story, I think is one that's really just exciting that is getting told in a game kind of like this. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, I, I mean, you, 
that opening sequence when you're kind of like going to the city for the first time and it's like mm -hmm. the people group that the main character is Eldens or elders or something like that yeah it's like you you loves or something i don't yeah. know <laughs> they like make a point of talking about it. it's like oh i don't see people who look like me in this mm -hmm. city and it's like oh okay video game let's go like let's get into yeah. it like i i'm interested to see how that how that carries forward um, yeah keeping my fingers crossed <laughs> i'm like please do a good please job. actually carry through um <laughs> is does the like kind of anime cutscene style of it uh, can like I feel like it's peppered in quite a bit up front. Does it continue at that same kind of cadence as you play through? Where I am, it's still like I feel like it's still getting it's lessening, but it's still pretty prominent. Mm -hmm. So, and again, this is meant to be like a 60, 70, 100 hour game from what I hear. So, I'm assuming that I'm still very much in like the intro part of the game. <laughs> mm, yeah very prologue well, have you made it out of the prologue yet do you know no i'm still in the demo so yeah. <laughs> so for sure i'm in the intro part of the game yeah yeah that makes sense uh but i'm super enjoying it and uh i think what i've decided is because i just i got the demo uh i think after i get through uh neva that's gonna be my next pickup is probably mm. the full game of this mm -hmm. speaking of uh I've, I, I've only played about an hour so far but Neva is just like everything I have I was hoping it would be Aww. um the first time you get to like bend down and like pet the little wolf pup yeah uh and then the first time that like the baddies like grab the wolf pup and you just like hear it whimpering oh my gosh mm -hmm. like ah uh, absolutely tears at my heart um I don't I don't like you mentioned that you cried maybe a couple of times while you're playing yeah I feel like the emotions are going to be soaring high for me on this one. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's like there are like I can like um, multiple times there were definite cries um, mm. for sure. So, yeah, I think if you're a crier, this is a game where you're going to cry at least three times for sure. Um, but yeah, no, I thought it was a beautifully done game. Um, I still think it's like a great expansion on what they did with greece um i still think because a lot of people are like game of the year neva that's going to be like the best game in you know everything and i'm like ah, i still think a thousand times resist personally is my game of the year uh that's been a question i've gotten from a couple folks mm -hmm. it's like oh did neva beat it and i was like mm, i think it's a very good game i think for me a thousand times resist is still up there as we're getting close to game of the year talk. yeah it's got to be hard to compare the two like a thousand times yeah. resist is such a a complex and like well-rounded story that like i i don't know that i could do a good job mm -hmm. putting them next to each other and yeah how anything is going to be a thousand times in my book uh i i don't know at this point <laughs> i know um, it's like in statistics when you have the like the outlier and you're supposed to throw out outliers i'm like i almost feel like i need to at some point maybe put a thousand times for this aside because it's kind of ridiculous how much I love that game and yeah. how powerful I think it is. But we'll come to that when we get to the end of the year and we start talking game of the year. <laughs> I do think I saw something like there, some like South by Southwest award or something that. Yes, they Times did just, just recently win. Um, let me look it up. What the specific name was. I know they were nominated for a golden joystick. Um, they were nominated for best or for game of the year, best narrative or something like that, which is incredible. Um, but they did win something i don't think it was south by south i think it maybe was like pax mm. australia because that just happened something australia i think you're right um yeah i remember so, there being an x <laughs> yeah let's see they are i feel like it should be very close to their social media like the top of their social media because it happened literally like days ago um i am scrolling as fast as i can but Nope, it was South by Southwest Sydney. They win Best International Game. So, yeah, pretty dang incredible. Um, they're also, they're just, like, on all of the lists. Like, every time I see a top 2024 game list, most underrated game list, um, I see them on both of those, which is great, because it's, like, they're both being seen as an underrated title, but they're being also 
cited in some of the top lists I've seen from some of the biggest outlets that are currently doing these roundups. So mm -hmm. I'm just so happy because I was really worried people would sleep on this game. Well, and because y'all are part of the Geeks and Grounds community, you were some of the first, some of the first <laughs> to enjoy this game. Um, yeah, that's what I've been getting up to. Um, and yeah, again, huge congrats to that team. So Jenny, what, do you, what have you been getting up to the last week or so? Um more metaphor refantasio just excited to keep playing it um i swear i just i need the music on vinyl like it's i normally only collect indie game vinyls just as a personal like mm -hmm. this is the thing i'm gonna like force my not force myself like kind of give myself a cap so i'm not just like buying everything yeah. um i was like i want it to be indie games that i really enjoy and now i'm like you know what i'm gonna extend that to the metaphor <laughs> metaphor refantasio soundtrack because it's so dang good um i can just like than... picture working in excel with that soundtrack on in the background it's like it's like it's the most motivating <laughs> like i have played it in like during work like it is now part of my work playlist. okay and it is one of those where i'm like if you need to get heads down and just like crank through some emails like it works really well um but i've been watching um so Rama One Half came out on Netflix. This is the sort of the reboot. Um, they are like the remake, I guess, of the anime that came out back in like the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, this is one of my favorite anime of all time. And I feel like it is the Netflix remake has actually for once, I feel like in a remake <laughs> has done it justice where the animation is just perfectly on point. They draw in elements from the manga and um, expand upon the personality of the artist in ways that is just, it's so delightful to watch. Like, even if you've never seen it, I would say just watch like the first episode and see the animation. It is like the animation that I grew up with and I love the most because it's so expressive mm. uh, and outlandish. And the, the premise is very outlandish as well. It's um, basically a high schooler. Um, he and his dad went training in these cursed falls, you know, springs in China, and each of them fell into a cursed spring. And he basically gets touched with, I think what it is, cold water? And he gets turned into a girl. And then when he gets touched with hot water, he turns back into a boy. Mm. And so gender hijinks, oh my God. And um, the main arc is that he and this other high schooler, her name is Akane, they are set to be married by their fathers. Um, they both detest each other. And so you have Perfect. this great enemies to lovers, kind of rivals to lovers mm. tension between them. But of course... On top of that, uh, they each have their own set of suitors that come in and they ha have like anything goes martial arts as the like fighting element. So there's outlandish martial arts that gets featured in every episode. It just kind of Katamari balloons its way through <laughs> <laughs> like and becomes so weird and wonderful. And um, in an, its time, there were like definite problematic moments and like elements of the show. And so I'm very interested to see as this reboot continues because we're only like three episodes in mm. how they maybe reframe they clean and it up restructure <laughs> some of it um yeah. or if they don't like what what does it look like so really interested but it's just been a delight i have had so much fun watching it um it was a show my brother and i watched when we were kids and we like sang the theme song all the time so Aww. it's been really good um and then I, with Sam, re-watched, well, I watched it again. Sam watched it for the first time, The Haunting of Hill House, um, which is, I had forgotten how solid of a haunted house story that was. Um, if you are looking for something kind of scary, but a bit more psychological with its scares, um, and you have a Netflix subscription, Haunting of Hill House, highly recommend it. Um, it is a haunted house story as one might have anticipated from the title and it details um this family that has in their childhood um experienced some really traumatic events at this house mm. that is haunted and what happens as adults is they sort of revisit a lot of those traumas and like revisit the house itself really good um 
it's a Mike Flanagan joint, and I feel like every year he comes out with something new for Halloween. <laughs> I was really missing it this year, to be honest. I was like, I oh man. Apparently, I, I think he's over say... for Prime now or something, working on the new thing. So womp, womp. <laughs> Netflix fumbled the bag. Dang, I know, because I feel like he had um, this one. There was the Blythe Manor. That was which my was favorite. Of the really haunting. good. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed. There was like an Edgar Allan Poe themed one mm. that he did. Um, that was last year, the House of Usher. I really like Midnight Mass. That was like the year yeah. before that. I need to try Midnight Mass again because I think that was the one that for me fell flat. Mm. I think because Mike Flanagan loves his monologues. <clears throat> he loves a good character monologue. And I think when I had watched it in Midnight Mass, it I don't mind a monologue, but for whatever reason, I was like, okay, this is... It's all monologue. It's monologues <laughs> all the way down. <laughs> it is. And so I think it it didn't really hit for me but i've been meaning i was like maybe i'll try midnight mass again because you know i do like everything else maybe i'll try hill house again because that was my Mm -hmm. big turnoff for hill house and it was like the first one that i tried to watch from him yeah now that i'm into his world maybe i can go back and watch that and appreciate it Um, yeah yeah (laughs) i feel like yeah because it's funny um because i didn't even realize it until we started watching and Sam hadn't watched any of Mike Flanagan stuff. So I was like, let's start with like Hill house. Cause that's the first one. That's where I got in. And like, mm. I feel like it's a good starting point. Um, and as we were watching it this time around, I was like, yeah, Oh my God, I forgot how much he really loves like the slow zoom character monologues where you're like, it's been five minutes yeah. and this story is still happening. <laughs> I just try to imagine what it's like to be a, like an actor on that show, like oh memorizing God, yeah. the f- like several pages of dialogue at a time. Oh my gosh. Well, it's just, I was kind of like, man, what if conversations actually worked like that? You know, you find the right person and it it can feel that way. That's true. (laughs) That is very true. Um, So yeah, that's what I've been primarily up to. Um, I feel like I put, I stopped, I've I've reached a little bit of a roadblock. I didn't do any reading this week and I'm like, oh, I need to like keep it at a good clip because I'm Mm. trying to get through, what is it? Is Oathbringer the last book before the next sort of Sanderson release? Which one? Words of Radiance? Uh, rhythm. I forget. I think rhythm. Rhythm, is the last rhythm one. of War. Yeah, you're right. But now um, that, you know, Sunlit Man's in there as the follow up to that. So. Oh my gosh. Yeah. We got some like work to do. I need to take like a week. Well, what's nice is I'm, I'm going to Japan soon and I'm just like, oh man, that plane ride. Which I feel like every plane ride, I'm like, I'm going to write a book. I'm going to edit these videos. I feel like I'm going to get everything done in the plane ride. And usually I get like negative things done. Somehow I <laughs> somehow I come out of the plane ride. I'm like, I, I have worked. more to do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you get like that with plane rides. I am but... the inverse. Like I go in with the expectation that like this is the one time in life where no one gets to ask me to do anything. And so I like, it's like, this is where I'm going to play video games or watch that movie that I Mm -hmm. knew I wasn't that into, but it's perfect for the movie, for the plane ride kind of thing. Like I, I love the plane as like my one escape from my to-do list. So Uh, it probably, I guess technically I probably am also making negative progress on my to-do list because of that, but I don't have the expectation that I'm going to make progress. So it's funny because like the to do list on the plane never is even work. It's like I'm going to finish these games. I'm going to like do all these things that I said. I like I'm going to I'm going to knit this amigurumi. I'm going to like do. I'm like, what do I think the plane like is? I feel like it should be a time portal to allow us to just have that relaxation, but it needs to be like ten times longer. But I actually don't want to be on a plane that long. Yeah, absolutely Uh, fair. Absolutely fair. Yeah, but yeah, so it might be on a plane list for me. But that is it, I think, for our pastry case shenanigans. Um, just to highlight really quickly before we get into the monthly brew or the weekly brew, um, some game releases that we wanted to note. Wilmot Works It Out comes out on the 23rd, uh, and that's one that has a Steam Next Fest demo, and it may still have the demo by the time this is out i'm not entirely sure um but definitely if you're a wilmot warehouse fan wilmot works it out it's a great puzzle game 
Uh, Cabernet, which I'm very excited for, is releasing on the 24th. That is a game where you play a recently converted vampire and you have to deal with the ethical dilemma of having used to be a healer, I think a doctor of some sort, and now having to drink blood of the villagers that live nearby. Um, So there's like a little bit of ethics there. There's some social intrigue. um, And I remember playing the demo and just being hooked because your outfits actually change and like buff, debuff your different conversational and like social abilities. (laughs) So I was like, that's really fun. I love when fashion plays and has a function. Um, That sounds like that's a really killer premise. I like that a lot. It was a great demo. And um what you call it? It was voiced too. It was voice acted. So I think if you're into games that are like very similar, like very narrative heavy visual novel esque with choices, I feel like that's probably up the alley for most of the people who listen to this podcast. Um, I would recommend checking it out. And a quick note, not a full release, but the pristine cut of Slay the Princess is coming out on October 24th. And This is to quote the devs. um, This expands the game by roughly 35%. What? (laughs) Yeah. So new voice lines, new illustrations, new music, um, glow ups for some of the current routes that you may get to, um, huge amount of additional support and language language support, console support. um, And this is coming to everyone. So if you've already purchased the game, you will get the pristine cut, which is freaking incredible what? um and also i guess it's a good time to mention mm. because it just so happens that slay the princess is the game for november <gasps> so uh-huh. our november brew will be slay the princess um and that'll be an exciting one because november is a bit of a short month with um, the thanksgiving holiday in the u.s so that'll be a fun one where we play and we just get as many roots as we can and discuss the game um for november so yeah that's november's game announcement Oh, I cannot wait to get back into this game. I yes. uh, I think I may have mentioned, I think I found the absolute shortest run possible on accident one time. And Surprising so nobody. <laughs> I'm ready for, I want to do like a long detailed, like get me through that logic tree run. I want to be yeah. like deep into it. So yes. yeah, I'm very excited for this one. Same. I think this is a game which is really interesting. We actually had um, Tony and Abby, the developers on the show before the launch of the original, I think it was like when the demo was out. So we have not actually officially played the game, but they've been like part of the extended Geeks and Grounds universe and family for the whole time, essentially. Um, we talked with them about horror and what it means to make horror games. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm excited to to play Slay the Princess officially. Um, all right. With that, I will say if you're interested in subscribing to the newsletter go to geeksandgrounds.com that's where all of this stuff will be given in link form so that you have everything you need to investigate what we've talked about further all right next fest next fest um i'm really curious uh i'm curious as you were exploring demos or as you go into next fests what is your goal like, what is your purpose in exploring the demos? I think generally it's to, pl- like, I, you know what it is? It's the Costco mentality. Like, mm-hmm. I am there to run in circles and get as many samples as I can. Mm-hmm. And to, like, uh, give me that little hunk of cheese. Give me that little orange chicken. Give me that yeah. little shrimp. Like, that's how I approach next fest. Like I am just yeah. going to go around and it's like, I like the title. I like the, the title card. Uh, oh, I haven't played any platformers yet. Here's a platformer. And this one looks like it has an interesting mm. story. Let me get into a story. And so okay. n- number one, I, I, I think I'm doing <laughs> next fest wrong. That's probably what I need to give as no, a caveat what? based on my experience this October, which was not very positive. I think I need a new strategy. I think the Costco approach is actually failing me pretty hard. So what is your approach, Jenny? Well, I just want to, I want to take a moment. I mm. don't think there is a way to do next fest wrong. I think maybe you've just found a different goal and your old strategy isn't <laughs> serving that 
new goal. Wow. Perhaps. What? Um, you should talk to my therapist. What a good new narrative you've provided for me. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Can I, I'll be like, I'd like to take a cut. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I think because, okay. I also feel like this next fest was, I don't know if it's because I just am in a point where I'm like, most of the games that I was really excited for have come out. So I'm in this, like, maybe this Mm -hmm. valley in terms of I don't have anything I'm super, super hyped on. And so that's just where my excitement lies. But I felt like this was a really, like, there wasn't a anchor game that really got me like, oh my God, I think this is the game of the next fest. I think Mm -hmm. this is so perfect. You know, where I feel like in previous nest fests, I had at least one or two games where I was like, this is what I was waiting for. Or this was like the surprise that has totally carried me through um and made me excited for a launch i think there are some games that are really really strong Mm. but a lot of them were games that i already had a little bit on my radar so i wasn't necessarily surprised by anything um and i do oh man i feel very conflicted because i feel like i was looking at the charts and i feel like there were some games that i was actually quite surprised for as high up as they were Mm. um and that maybe that's just like my bias and sort of like not understanding completely some of the pc gaming desires um and some of the markets that come to a steam next fest but i felt like the charts didn't like bring up titles that i felt in previous next fests i would have seen maybe in the top like 50 even um so it was really interesting yeah like i feel like even looking in the top 50 there were some games where i was like i don't see some of my faves that i think should be up here up here and so i don't know this is the biggest next fest we've had ever um we've had close to like it was 2700 plus games so with that many titles it's like how how diluted is Mm -hmm. this pool um and there were some games in there that I was just like, I don't, I've never heard of them. Mm. I feel like people are playing them, but I don't know. I feel like it was just kind of a lackluster fest for me as well. Um, that's not to say the demos that we played were bad necessarily, but it was like a really interesting, it was interesting feeling <laughs> for sure. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me. And I I wonder if that is where like we need to like step up and like do some serious curation work because Mm -hmm. the the curation feels like almost non-existent and like yep i got the feed that was like we think you'll like these and it was like for whatever reason i don't know if it's because of like like the few like i usually am bouncing between switch and my steam deck and so Mm -hmm. it doesn't have a very robust picture of like who i am as a player because of like that missing link but it, the games that were recommended to me didn't really jive. Similar to you, I tried to like sort based on what was really like popular, and I still was having a really hard time finding mm. games that I was really into. I saw a lot of like first person shooters and like bullet hell games this year, which are like interesting. Not typically my vibe. I what, when you say that like you were seeing a lot of things that were not typical for like what you would hope to see or expect to see. What were some of the trends and themes that you were seeing? Um, I think I also noted a lot of first-person shooters, which I wasn't as surprised by that necessarily. Um, But I think... Yeah, I I think that was actually probably it. So more first-person shooters. I feel like there were some games at the top. Like There was this game like The Precinct. I was like, what is this? I have never seen this ever. Hmm. And it's this game that has like taken over. And so I was like, maybe it's just I'm not the audience. And so it's never been targeted towards me. And I'm only seeing it because I'm now looking at this like global list. Hmm. Um, I think you're absolutely right. The curation is essentially like it's non-existent on a personal level. So and I think what's really interesting is we're very used to like on social media algorithms really curating very finely like what we are interested in like yeah what you can say what you want about TikTok but like if it if it detects you like something 
<laughs> you will be shown that you're gonna thing. get that thing um and i think it's really interesting because even for a while i felt like steam was slightly improving its personal recommendations like i feel like algorithmically it was like showing me games that i was into but this next fest was really interesting because i feel like it was a back step um compared to previous next step oh, fests wow. i've had in terms of like the things that they've put into place and like how well I felt like they actually followed through with recommendations. Mm. Um, and yeah, I think it was tough because I feel like my goal with next fest is often to, I think I have two primary goals. My number one goal is check out the games that I've been most excited about and wish listed and see if I actually really still want to wish list them still. Um, and so I think that for me helped. And they did have a list of like, here are the games you've wishlisted hmm. that have demos. And that was the number one helpful tool for me because I'm like, I've wishlisted these games. I already know I'm interested in them and they have demos. Great. That was like literally 30 of the <laughs> demos that I downloaded from the jump. It was very easy for me. And beyond that, it got really kind of touch and go sure. um i think if you haven't like i don't know how many wish lists you have on steam but if you don't have very many wish lists that probably meant that category for you was either non-existent or did not have as much because you have a smaller pool of wish lists to like pull from when you say wish lists you're mm -hmm. saying you can have more than one list or there's multiple things on your singular list? Multiple things on your singular okay. list. Okay, if you were about yeah. to tell me there are multiple wish list capabilities, like, oh, here's my dark <laughs> fantasy wish list, I was going to be like, I know nothing. I just know nothing. But okay, cool. I'm Honestly, not if they had that, that would be incredible. I would love that functionality so much. Um, Steam, but yeah. if you're looking for a product person, get me on. Get me in the game. I'm ready. Honestly. Honestly. <laughs> let's go. Let's get Joel hired. Get Joel um, <laughs> hired. <laughs> but funny. yeah, I feel like, unfortunately, the tags are also, which is what Steam uses for the primary algorithm, are so vague. It's like action, adventure, story totally rich. Agree. I'm like, 2D. Okay, yeah, 2D, I guess. <laughs> I can see that. Um, and so it's tough because, yeah, the they have these filters in place, but they're so inconsistent and so broad in a lot of cases, they're not very useful. Mm. Um, but you're right. This is why I think having podcasts like this, communities like Geeks and Grounds, where people are playing these demos and sharing specifically what they liked and what they didn't like is really helpful uh, because ultimately... <laughs> I've been saying this, and I know a lot of people have said this, so I'm not saying anything new. But I think that the point we are at with the internet, um, it's about the communities you foster and like the recommendations you get from people, because everything else ends up being just noise at this point. So it's about curation on the internet more than anything at mm -hmm. this point. Death of the internet, or something like that. What's it called? Some, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, as we get into our list, I guess, um, I think generally you had a more positive experience than I had. So I'm, I'm curious if you want to kick us off, yeah. uh, what was coming through on top? So just to share with folks what we're, what we're going to do, um, we all, we played demos all week. Um, and so we thought we'd come in with our top, did we end up with top three each? Yeah. Top so this, these each. are our top three demos, um, from next fest. We may have time for a little rapid fire um because we definitely played more <laughs> demos than this but we thought we'd want to highlight the ones that kind of stuck with us um and so yeah i guess i will go first um i am on a survival horror kick signalis has infused my brain with wanting more survival horror and so when i saw the sorry we're closed demo i said yes please be good because mm -hmm. um, this this looks like it could be the perfect follow-up for me for Signalis. Um, it releases on November 14th, so it's coming out oh, soon. relatively soon. Yeah, I'm very excited. Uh, it's developed by Ala Mode Games and published by Akupara Games. And it is a survival horror single-player game. Um, it says it has rich lore, deep characters, and multiple endings. And what I loved, and I mentioned this in our preview Steam Next Fest portion last week, is that it has the darkness and goriness that you would expect from survival horror, where it's like mm. things are rusty and decrepit and like there's guts and spikes and ugh, it's like nasty. Um, but then the character design is like 
rave kid meets magical girl like london scene <laughs> it just it feels so vibrant and like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. stylish um you have this pantheon of demons that the game sort of introduces you to and it seems like the premise is you are sort of angsting and lonely because you've you're still missing your, I think your ex girlfriend of three years ago. So you've been pining for a long time. And this demon basically focuses their attention on you and says, aha, you're going to be mine. And so you're trying to escape the clutches of this demon who has given you this power of the third eye. It's amazing. I had a great time with it. Uh, I just, it's so fun. If you get the chance, like the demo is still up. Um, I think many of these demos may still be up for a few extra days because developers have learned a week is not enough time to get your demo featured um, with 3,000 demos available. Um, I would say if you're looking for survival horror, I think this could be something really special. Um, The combat system is the unique part. I think... um, In most survival horror, from my experience, it seems like you're either third person looking top down or you're in first person, but it seems like the traditional is third person. Mm. In this game, you switch between the two. So you have the option of anytime you want, holding down the left trigger and taking on a first person perspective, which allows you to, because the camera is fixed when you're in third person, see things that are outside of the camera which is really cool because then you rad. can like look and see if an enemy is starting to walk down the corner or um, see if there's something like that maybe you can investigate that you wouldn't have noticed looking top down. I thought that was really fun. It was also uh, not the greatest with my controller because I'm not very dexterous and the, my controller is old. And so some of the aiming in first person was like, oh my gosh, this game is on hard mode because... <laughs> <laughs> really a little bad tough. first person but i think it's a really cool innovation um and they also have an element where instead of especially because we're playing signalis so i got to compare and contrast a lot um with signalis i think one of the things we talked a lot about is the six item limit you cannot have more than six items if you're playing the traditional route mm-hmm. That includes healing, it includes key items, and it becomes this really interesting management. Um, With Sorry We're Closed, you have much more flexibility. You always have like three items that are dedicated to healing, slots dedicated to healing. You have your key items, and you have these like artifacts you find that I think will act as like buffs. So, yeah, really cool, really stylish. Uh, I cannot wait to play it, and I'm so happy it's coming out basically right before my plane ride to Japan. So I think this might be my plane game. <laughs> Perfect. Yep. Uh, I was actually like looking at the art style again, and it reminded me a lot of, there was a graphic novel series. It's it's wrapped up now uh, called The Wicked and the Divine. Mm. And it's kind of like a, um, all of the, the kind of evil gods, like gods of death. And you're like your satanic equivalents from various pantheons. Uh, are like existing today in like a modern day London situation. Yeah. And it, you're like following like a mortal who's trying to like get into the circle and like understand what's going on. And I, the, the neon and the designs mm-hmm. reminded me a lot of that from like looking at w- watching back through the the video of that. So, yeah. Yeah. I think what's cool is I feel like, and I even think I mentioned this when I was playing through it, but um, I feel like we've gotten a lot of like Greek pantheon games, which is great. I love Greek mythology, but this being more angels and demons felt and not like of the Greek nature, at least mm-hmm. at least currently, I felt like it was also refreshing because I'm like, it's another pantheon and they're clearly designed for you to like lust over a little bit. Like the way that they've done the art, it's like, obviously mm-hmm. they want you to feel some things. Um But it was really nice because I was like, oh, this feels refreshing because it's a different kind of pantheon to enjoy. That's awesome. I I mean, yeah, I mean, I feel like I'm just kind of over the Greek pantheon at this point. Yeah, that's so 2000 and what? 
to two. Four. I mean, I'm gonna watch. Them. When did Percy- Hades come out? <laughs> I'm gonna watch Percy Jackson season two when it drops. So I'm. I mean, I'm not. I'm not actually over it. I just watched <laughs> the Chrono series with Jeff Goldblum. Like, I'm not over it, guys. You I know. know. I'm not over uh, it. Honestly, a good pantheon is always welcome, but it is nice <laughs> to see something different happening. <laughs> a good pantheon is hard to find. Um, yes. Well, I, uh, my absolute top game of all of the demos that I played, I would only give like maybe a six out of 10. So again, oh, did no. not have a fantastic experience. Um, but that's what we're going to talk about first. And that is Chrono Sword. Uh, Chrono Sword. We did talk a bit about this last time. It's a Souls like, but uh, more like pixel style animation, like top down 3D uh, movement. And as I uh, spent some time playing through it, there's some things that I definitely appreciated. Like one, they have absolutely adopted the like FromSoft style of resource management mm-hmm. and moving through the world. And so from that perspective, it was very easy <clears throat> to like pick up, like having, having played Souls games, like it was very easy to pick up and be like, I don't really need much of a tutorial. Like I know exactly what's going on and I can, I can make my way through this world. I also thought the initial level design was uh, really, really cool. It, it, it probably leans more toward um, the Bloodborne look and feel than like the Dark Souls, Demon Souls world. If I were to like mm-hmm. give it a comparison. Um, how it, however, there's a big mechanical twist in this game that I think is what they're trying to like position as like their main differentiator. And that is you are a time traveler. And so essentially, as you go to certain points in the game, uh, they add a puzzling element where you mm. will go through a time gate to like 24 years in the future. And so you go to see the same landscape, but like everything's kind of destroyed. And then you find the t- and like it helps you navigate through the town and then you find a different time gate and now you're on the other side of the town so that is something that does not exist in a lot of the like the from soft games at least and i thought was Mm -hmm. a very uh cool added element Mm -hmm. um i here is the thing that it absolutely did not deliver on which i think is like if you're not doing this well in a souls game i don't know how you're successful as a game and that is the attack system felt so sluggish. Mm. Like you hit a button and it felt like there was a two second delay before your character actually moved and swiped the baddie. And like in a game that's all about like survival and like timing and paying attention to bosses attacks, uh, that feels like a a non-negotiable to me. Mm -hmm. And when I think about like comparable... When I think about comparable look and feel for like what has set the bar for me in this kind of top down 3D game, it is Hades. And like Hades combat feels great. It doesn't matter what weapon you're using. It doesn't matter what your build is. It it feels good when you attack in Hades. And when I'm playing this game, it's like, yeah, the movement feels pretty decent. The dodging feels okay, but the attack feels terrible. And like, I think I even noticed that someone in our Discord chat had said something similar. It's just like, that feels like an absolute dagger to release a Souls, a Souls-like demo. Mm. And the demo attack system is is sluggish like that. That feels like, take an extra quarter and refine that before you release your demo. Uh, would be my, my feeling. Dang, that's that's unfortunate. I'm looking at the Steam page right now, and um, they don't have a release date, but they are aiming for an early access. So um, hopefully this is something where it's like, I mean, obviously the ideal is they address this before the early access um, because it seems like a very, very big priority. Um, (laughs) But hopefully because they are planning on an early access period, um, it gives them that time to just polish polish up some of the attack timing um, in particular. It's also interesting. I feel like the, uh, speaking about um, 
how your character's outfits can impact things. Mm. You know, in the Souls games, you have a lot of control over what you're wearing at any given time. And there are kind of like hidden buffs and things to what you're wearing. You change outfits in this. Like you go, you, okay. get, you kind of change what you're wearing. But your sprite, your your character doesn't change when you put on the different things. It's oh, like, yeah. that matters. I don't know, y'all. Like, I feel like I wouldn't, I again, I kind of have this expectation. And maybe I shouldn't for like a more pixely uh, game experience. But I was, yeah, that felt like a bit of a, bit of a dagger for me. Yeah, no, it's tough because it's like a lot of the teams, especially in the games that we're playing are indie. So it's like there may be budget constraints with stuff like that. And, you know, obviously there are lots of games that have different outfits that don't change the actual physical appearance. But I am with you where I'm like, if you are changing like weapons, outfits, I am at the point where I'm just like, I do want it to be visually represented because that's part of the fun. Um, so yeah, it's like, I can feel why that business wise and like development wise may not be a thing, but as a player, I want to see it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know. I, I think it may be with some further development, it could have some things to offer here. I would say mm -hmm. from a demo perspective, if all I had to go on was this, I probably would not buy this, um, mm. which, you know, that's, that's just my take. Yeah. Dang. Oh, well, man, I'm nervous now because that was the best <laughs> demo that you played. Yep. <laughs> oh, no, you should have pinged us. You should have asked in the Discord. <laughs> I, you know, you y'all started the, the Discord list oh. after the time that I had allotted to play my demos. And so, oh, like, shucks. I found it and I was like, yes, yes, yes. And I didn't have any time to play any of them. So darn. Oh, one of those that's things. Okay. Yes. There's still demo time available for anyone who's like, dang it, I miss these demos. I want to play. I will say again, most developers, not all, but most of them will keep the demos live for about a week after simply because they understand that there is just too many demos out. Yes. <laughs> so if you hear of anything you're excited about, do check it out just in case because you may still be able to play. All right. What's next yeah. on your list? So the next one I played that was also really fun. Um, this is from YCJY Games. Um, they have done... Um, Gosh, I feel like they did Sea Salt, which was really good. Aquatic Adventure of the Last Human, which was really interesting. These are older games. Like, I think Sea Salt was in like 2019 or 2020. Um, Aquatic Adventure of the Last Human was like 2016. So this is a team that's been around. They've been making games for a while now. Um, Keep Driving is basically like modern day Oregon Trail. What? That's probably one of the easiest ways I can sell it to you. You are, <laughs> so in this demo, you are a person who is taking this road trip to your friend's house to just like go hang out and play video games with them. And in sort of Oregon Trail fashion, you have like the top, maybe like two thirds of the, of the page as your car. You can see it sort of panning, you know, the roadway. <coughs> excuse me, you're driving. And in the bottom, like third ish, or maybe quarter, you have your trip odometer, you have your car, like, sort of um, your car health, essentially your gas, your energy, the snacks that you have. And you basically are plotting out your road trip. And each sort of leg of your trip, you'll have encounters that happen, where as a driver, you engage with things in sort of a turn-based battle style situation where there are like potholes or flocks of sheep will block your way or you're stuck behind a tractor and you have to use like your supplies that you've packed with you in your car and like your sort of skills to mitigate like the stresses of driving with those you know impediments by your side and not lose too much energy it is just such a fun resource management driving game um a great take on the genre it, the soundtrack is really fun i had a great time with it um and so it's just one of those games where i'm like if you enjoy road trip games if you enjoy management rpgs like this is this is one to play and i think this is if i had to pick i think this is probably well i did pick it's one of the three <laughs> that i wanted to talk about it's one of the highlights of the show for me um I'm yeah. so bummed because I saw this one come through on my list like three mm -hmm. or four times. Like, 
nah, maybe this other one. And then I tried the other one and it was like a huge letdown. And now that I know that this one that I almost chose so many times was actually great, I feel like I really <laughs> missed out. This one, I will say like the demo's still up. I'm looking at it right now. I would say play it. I'm probably going to go back and play it a little more, to be very honest, because I had a blast. Um, it's just, it's the management that I love. And just, again, it just captured that feeling of being on a road trip and having music play and watching the road go by and the scene just go by. Mm. Um, you can pick up hitchhikers if you would like to like add different characteristics and skills, but they will also have maybe little traits that are like not as ideal. Like, there's a hitchhiker I picked up and she leaves messes in the trunk. Like she leaves her, gar her garbage everywhere. <laughs> you know, it's like things like that that you have to balance. And it was just very, very fun. Very cool. Yeah. I have to get into that one. All right. So <laughs> what was your next title that you wanted to highlight? Next on the list is Cats and Dice, mm -hmm. uh, which is, it's just Bellatro, but yahtzee instead of poker um mm -hmm. so you're trying to get dice numbers together to get runs and the same number together uh but instead of like collecting joker cards to create special effects you get little like cat icons that have different powers that impact what you're doing awesome which is to say not only is this not super creative but like the cats are way underutilized. I thought like a game called Cats and Dice would be a lot more cat forward and it oh. is not. It is dice forward. Um, I don't know. I would just, I don't know. Like my perspective is if you're looking for a game that has like a, a really fluid, well-crafted system for playing a game uh, repeatedly uh, and building up your skills, just play Bellatro. I I would not recommend this one. So oh. not much more to say about that, to be honest. Like I just didn't have a great time with it, uh, oh. unfortunately. Dang, that's oh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> uh, uh. Well, uh, to close out my top three, uh, I played Citizen Sleeper 2. It was one of those where I'm like, I know that this is probably going to be one of the top demos that I have. I was kind of on the fence of even playing it because I'm like, I know I'm going to like this. Does it even count? <laughs> Does it even count? Exactly. Um, but honestly, I'm really happy I, I did because I got to experience some of the ways that they're expanding upon the systems uh, from Citizen Sleeper 1, which mm. we played earlier in the year as a community. Um, and I was just really, really pleased with it. Um, I think a lot of the stuff that you know and love from the original S Citizen Sleeper, um, you still play a sleeper. I couldn't really determine at what point in time this was compared to the original game. Mm. It seemed like it was in the future, but not so far forward that things had totally shifted. Um, other companies, I think, seem to have arisen. So there's more of a corporate conflict cool. than before. Um, and the major addition to this compared to the first one is that instead of living life on your own, you are managing a crew. And so it is not you just as a oh. sleeper trying to escape and survive on your own. You are surviving oh. with other people. And I think that is honestly the addition that I was hoping to see. I didn't think about it, but once I saw it, I was like, yes, uh, this is what they needed to do. Because I think so much of the game in the original was about the ways that community and relationships with others help with your survival mm -hmm. um, in a system like capitalism and in a system where you are seen as a product, um, how do you find those human connections and those personal relationships? And I think to have it in the more immediate like interactions of the characters where you are not simply just like going home at the end of the day to be by yourself or with your cat, if you had a cat, um, but you're living and engaging with these people very regularly and you depend on one another in different ways. Um, more so than in the first game. Really cool. So the demo was a hefty demo. It was like an hour and a half Damn. for me playing. Um, I thought it was great. Did you get to, I mean, one of the things we were speculating about is if you got to uh, be in space or in, in like be in a ship, did you get any mm -hmm. feel or sense for that? 
Yes. So in the demo itself, uh, it showed the contract system where instead of doing odd jobs, um, where it's like you earn like eight cryo here, 13 cryo there, you have the opportunity to take on contracts where you are stocking up with fuel and supplies Mm. and then taking your ship to a location away from where you've docked and doing like overnight stays harvesting, you know, resources from different locations. And this comes with its own separate set of stresses and uh, dynamics that you have to play with um, where you can fail the contract and like get nothing when you return. You can perhaps fail the contract, but decide to do so because you want to gain other resources while you're out there. Really cool dynamics at play. So um, yeah. That's awesome. Very excited. Very excited. Oh man. To try that one out. Yes. <laughs> um, and close us out for our sort of detailed recap mm-hmm. of our our top <laughs> demos. Um, what was the last one that you wanted to highlight? <sighs> the last game that I tried that uh, I got reasonably far into was called Sultan's Game. Uh, since I haven't talked about this before, I'll read the synopsis. The Sultan commands you to play a cruel game. Each week, you must draw one of four special cards. The carnality card requires you to seek carnal pleasure. Extravagance compels you to spend lavishly. Conquer forces you into dangerous expeditions. And bloodshed demands a human... I can't read the rest. It cut off. Dot, dot, dot. Sacrifice, maybe? Um, that This comes from Double Cross, uh, the developer, uh, development team, 2P Games, the publisher. Um Here's what I will say. It is like someone took the idea of Yu-Gi-Oh and (laughs) made it less fun and maybe more problematic. Like, I don't know. I got, I got a decent of the way, a decent percentage of the way through this. And I was like, I don't think I'm okay with kind of the, um, fetishization is maybe too strong of a word but certainly like orientalism of Mm. what is happening here and then i remembered that in the opening of the demo there's a thing about how like this game is not supposed to represent any specific people or whatever which just feels like sure (laughs) you know what it reminded me of honestly i felt like uh, did you see the the kind of uh simu liu thing about the boba tea like mm-hmm. Canadian Shark Tank thing, yes. and their whole thing was like, "Well, we're ta- we don't we're taking out like the Asian culture part of boba tea." <laughs> I feel like I played the video game version of the boba tea incident, no. where they're like, oh, <laughs> "We're pulling any sort of like Near East Middle East culture out of this, and just doing this like fantastical representation of that." And it's like, "Well, I don't know anything about these developers or publishers." And I was just like, I don't know. I got a little ways into this and I was like, this doesn't feel good. And so I'm Mm. not going to keep going. Um, And that was my third best game experience that I had uh, during Steam Next Fest this year. Dang. Well, I guess, I mean, how long did you play these demos? Because I think one of the tips and one of the recommendations I would have is also if you're like, and and I think this comes with practice too, right? Because like the more you play demos, I think the more you start feeling out like, oh, I actually can tell this is not going to be for me versus, you know, actually maybe this one's worth trying a bit longer. Um, I would say like, as soon as you get those feelings of like, oh, this isn't for me, I would say just stop playing the demo because then that allows you to do that Costco taste test even faster, you know? Yeah. And I definitely tried that. I think Mm -hmm. I've played about 10 to 15 games and like just had like a lot of really bad experiences. Uh, I don't know, like Chrono Sword, I probably put like 45 minutes into Cats and Dice, uh, got maybe 15 and I was like, okay, I see what's going on here. I'm good. Mm -hmm. Sultan's game, maybe 15 to 20. Like I'm not dumping tons of time into these guys. It's just like, I had a lot of bad experiences in this next one. It was a real bummer. Dang. Well, that's unfortunate. Um, just to end on a bit more of a recommendation oriented note. Yeah, I get it. Get to it. Um, Make, bring us home. <laughs> yeah. So some rapid fire. So I ended up playing and I still have maybe about 15 demos I want to try and like get through tonight just to see how they play. But some additional highlights that were a bit cool, surprising, fun. Um, Symphonia, which is like a platformer 
uh, sort of precision platformer where you're like puzzling through. It's very Celeste-like. Um, you play a character that is going through the world of um, sort of music, I would say. Uh, and it's been decimated and you're trying to figure out what's going on. The story itself, honestly, I was like, mm, it's fine. But the music and the visuals, I think, were really interesting because this is a fully orchestrated score. Mm. And it felt like playing a sophisticated Whoa. version of the Silly Symphonies back in the day where it's like there's no dialogue. You just have these instruments that are kind of like talking with their instrumentation. Um, and you're going through and like platforming and just sort of maneuvering and sort of, uh, yeah, traversing the world. So it's about traversal, again, very much like Celeste, I would say, in that way. Um, Tethergeist is another one that's if you're into the precision platformer, uh, Celeste like style of gameplay. I think this is a really good one to look at, particularly because Tethergeist is a game about um, a young girl coming of age, learning to sort of channel her like energy to get up to this like basically, I forget what they call it. It's like a ritual or something that she's supposed to get up to, but she mm. can't because her spirit energy is like not as developed as her peers. And so they're like, you should do this next year, but she wants to do it this year. So she goes and tries it. Um, it works similarly to Celeste where you are hopping around. You can collect little energy beads to give yourself essentially like a double jump. But the difference is that as you are collecting these energy beads and getting ready to do your double jump, you can slow down time and kind of maneuver your, they call it the tether. Um, so you can make some more interesting complex movements with your jumps. Uh, I found it really fun. And it's like Celeste for thinkers. <laughs> where Celeste is very much reaction time based. Oh, and so you yeah. don't have, like you have to think through the puzzles, but once you are moving in Celeste, you kind of have to keep going. Mm -hmm. Tether Geist provides you the opportunity to slow down and That's think awesome. about what your next steps are. Highly recommend it um, if you like that kind of feel. Uh, I didn't even finish the demo, honestly, but I got, I played for like an hour and a half and I mm. thought it was great. So I was like, this is enough for me. Um, I was just having fun. Um, a game that was, I think, too challenging for me, but I feel like we have enough rhythm game fans in the community. I wanted to give it a shout. Uh, it was called Beat Block. Um, and my note I wrote down, I said, for the rhythm freaks out there. Um, <laughs> it's one of those games like, so it's like Pong, where you have a slider that you slide around with your mouse. Um, and instead of having the rhythm like beats come down vertically, like you would in Guitar Hero or Rift of the Necro Dancer, which was another demo that was awesome. Um the beats actually come from all around the circle. So it's like 360 and you have to move the slider, like the pong slider ah. to catch the beat cool. in the circle. Really cool. I was very bad at it, but uh, I think if you're a good rhythm game aficionado, like this would be right up your alley. I just have fallen off of my rhythm game like mm. habit. And so I feel like it was just a little bit, the, the, the 360 angle of it got a bit too much for me. Um, but also you know, Rift of the Necro Dancer. That's another really good demo. That kind of reminds me of the the piano game from the Final Fantasy releases last year. It was like that kind mm -hmm. of like two circles that you're like moving around. But it was yep. like that was you were moving from the inside outside. Going from the outside in to like catch the beat feels very interesting. Yeah, it was really fun. It's super minimal where it's like, it's basically you are this little block um, and it's black and white and it's just blocks in black and white. Mm. It's very simple. Um, I would be really interested to see if someone very good at the game played it and like how far they got because I was good enough that I could feel like it was maybe fun, but not good enough where I was like, if I was an advanced player, would I think it's fun? <laughs> Wasn't that good? Gotcha. Um, but I had a good time with what I played. Um, Sopa. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, just that was it. Oh, uh, Sopa, which is um, by... Do, 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 do. I want to make sure. It's called Sopa St Tale of the Stolen Potato. It is by Studio Bando. Uh, this is a game about this young boy, Miho. He steps into the pantry to get potatoes for his grandma who's making soup in the kitchen. Um, 
And like kids' imaginations do, his imagination kind of flies away and he envisions a frog that steals his grandma's potatoes and takes them to the black market. So he <laughs> jumps into the pantry Narnia style to try and get the potatoes back. Incredible. Um, really fun, charming, whimsical. The visuals, a little rough, I'm not going to lie, mm. but the story was charming and the world was charming enough that I didn't really care that it was a little rough on the eyes at some points. Um, was it like a, a happy version of Bramble? Um, <laughs> I guess, yeah. <laughs> yeah, much more happy, um, for sure. Definitely much more happy. <laughs> um, I think the game is going to play with moving back and forth between mm. the real world and like seeing your grandma and maybe helping with the cooking and then going back into the pantry fantasy world. Um, so magical realism, childlike whimsy at its finest, really, um, at least thematically. Again, I think the visuals, I'm like, I hope it polishes up just a little bit, but um, that's okay because the story is very heartwarming. Um and then oh, there are so many. Honestly, I played a lot of really solid demos. I feel a little bad for saying this Steam Fest felt lackluster because I think there were a lot of strong games. It's just there wasn't like a highlight highlight for me. Mm. Um, I wanted to shout out really quickly Windblown. Um, I'm especially happy and proud because this is actually one that I worked on right before I left from Kepler. So I have like a little bit of, oh, oh this is one of the last yeah. projects I touched before piecing out um but windblown it's by the folks who made um dead cells but this is very different tonally um you play as these animal creatures who dash their way through levels really fun co-op um you're beating bosses it's about going fast getting upgrades um and urban myth dissolution center which is a mouthful to say this is a 2d sort of investigatory game so if you like games like Phoenix Wright or Case of the Golden Idol or mm. even Duck Detective where you're like having to acquire clues and then put them together to solve mysteries. This is of that nature. I will say there were a couple lines in there where I was like, this feels a bit out of left field and kind of weird. Like mm. um, there was one line where the girl was like, uh, she was talking about her stalker because this is a paranormal sort of thriller horror game so this girl was talking about an ex stalker and she was like oh he had brown hair he was medium build um he went to like this university he was a little woke and i was like what what <laughs> what is this so that was like the only moment where i was like what is this what and so i was like maybe this is a translation thing maybe i don't know what this is um but literally everything else about the game i was like I'm down. The story's a little repetitive. The writing's a little repetitive, but everything else feels fun to play. So I'm going to probably look into the team a little bit. Yeah. Some it's... incel is like the writer on that no, one. Maybe. But um, we'll just, we'll see. But um, I, that was like the one flag where I was like, I don't know what to make of that line, but mm. everything else was fine. So um, yeah, that was really interesting. But I, um, we were talking really before we otherwise. hopped on today that like one of the things that like was pinging on my radar with a, a lot of these games that you're we playing was like it. I am just worried that we are seeing more and more of the infusion of AI in some of these games that are coming out, like games where like the dialogue isn't quite jiving or the the animation or illustrations look almost like that ai generated type of illustration so i i don't know if it's like real or if i'm just getting paranoid but i mm. definitely like i'm not saying that this is an example but on the on the note of dialogue it's just something that like i am i didn't think that I needed to think about very much. And now I'm like, oh man, no, I do need to be thinking about that and a bit more conscious with how I'm searching for and looking at, at games now. So just a little something for me to think about. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the <clears throat> presence of AI everywhere is a problem for sure. Um, Steam is no different. I think we've already seen, like Steam has already had a problem where there are these like sort of I forget what they're called officially, but they're basically like tester steam pages or sho it's like shovelware steam pages almost mm. where it's like they create a steam page. Um, they being a company creates a steam page with the aim of um, testing out whether or not a game is profitable enough to 
make. And so you have these Steam pages of games that have maybe not enough wish lists. So those games are never going to get made because the company saw that like, oh, this idea didn't resonate. We're just not going to make this game. Um, that's been a practice Oof. on Steam for a very long time. Um, and with AI coming into play, that's definitely something we have to think about. Um, I will say... I mean, I'm trying to look and see if it's mandatory because I know that there is um, a disclosure that is available for developers where if you um, are a developer, you're making a game on Steam, you have like a checkbox that says whether or not you're using AI and in what capacity. Um, and I think it's mandatory, but I also have no idea how they're supposed to enforce that other than if your game gets reported, I guess that's when it gets enforced. Um, yeah. Okay. Here it is. So Steam's dev, uh, sort of dev backend has an update that says we are updating the content survey that developers fill out when submitting their game to Steam. The survey now includes a new AI disclosure section where you'll need to describe how you are using AI development in the development and execution of your game. And it's separates AI usage into two broad categories, pre-generated and live generated. Um, Valve will use this disclosure, this closure in our review of your game prior to release. We also will include your disclosure on Steam on the store page so customers can understand how this game uses AI. And I have seen this disclosure used. I've seen games identify like, oh, we've used AI in the pre-concepting mm. stage. So I know it's active. I just don't know how... Um, how many developers who are using AI in bad faith, you know, in yeah. the sort of negative faith would self-report. <laughs> well, and I don't know if I actually encountered that or not, you know? So I think yeah. just a, maybe just a call for me that I need to be a bit more critical of how I'm consuming and selecting games. Yeah, but it is, um, for folks who are curious, it's on the Steam store page. If you scroll down, I think it is supposed to be right around where they have the Steam um, or the PC, like, what is it? Um, my brain is failing me. Um, the system requirements. I mm. think it's like right above that. If there's an AI disclosure, that's where you'll typically see it. Uh, so yeah, but it is something that is good to flag and good to make sure we pay attention to. Like, are these games, you know, are we consuming games that are made with AI content? Um, and yeah, how are, how are we making sure that we avoid that content? Because just to be to be clear this is not an ai uh friendly space <laughs> uh yeah we do not yep. support that nope correct <laughs> um yeah but yeah steam next fest um again there are plenty more like there are some really good recommendations from community members in the discord um i know there are some that i have not mentioned that we just don't have time for at this point because Otherwise, I'd just be talking about tons and tons of demos. Um, just wanted to highlight a couple, um, just titles. I didn't ask for permission from the folks to say if I could share their recommendations. So I'm just going to share the titles of the demo. And if you recommend it in Discord, just know, thank you. Um, I just didn't have time to ask if I have permission to, sh to cite you um, and your handle. <laughs> so um, Proverbs, which is a Minesweeper puzzle game derivative i guess not derivative hmm. but like inspired by minesweeper game that looks amazing i'm very excited about it um there's a demo for a horror game called tenebris somnia that seems to combine some fmv with like point and click pixel hmm. art which is like really unique and cool um shine on my little son uh this person said recommend it for cosmic wheel sisterhood fans which ah. that hooked me um so very very excited about that um, so those are some additional just community recommendations really fast. Thank you to the folks who recommended those demos. Mm -hmm. um, last bit of news. So we announced our November game. That was Slay the Princess. Very excited. Um, pick it up. Start playing it now if you would like. We're going to be playing it through the month of November and talking about it. But you can start it now. I would mm -hmm. never discourage anyone from doing that. Um, but we are almost to 2025. <laughs> we are. It's, it's around the corner, folks. It's too close, honestly. Um, <laughs> it's too close. But 
this means we need to set up nominations for next year's games. Um, wanted to keep the same sort of style that we did this year because that felt like it worked really, really well, where about half the games will be nominated by you and voted on by you, the community, and then half um, we will curate. And um, so oh, nominations are open. As of you listening to this, um, please feel free to send me titles of games that you would like to see as um, options to be voted on during our voting period. Um, considerations, cost, time, genre, themes. Um, generally, we try to avoid games that are exclusive to one console. So if it's like a Switch exclusive or a PS5 exclusive, try to avoid that because we want games to generally be more accessible to folks. Um, and generally, if they're console ex exclusives and AAA titles, they tend to be more expensive. So we try to avoid that. Um, genre, I think my genre sort of no is like war games. <laughs> First person shooter war games, not here for it. I also like AI and capitalism. I also don't like the military industrial complex. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> I think on that. on that note, just generally, uh, first person games are things that are like we try to do as as little of as possible. So mm -hmm. if you're thinking about games, that's just something to to be considerate of. Yep, we have done first person games, but just to be accommodating of anyone who maybe gets motion sick. That's the reason why we typically mm -hmm. go lighter on the first person perspective. Um, and generally we like to look for games that offer something to talk about. So it doesn't have to be emotionally. <laughs> I love games that make me cry. That is typically where I will lean. Um, games that are emotionally just like intense, mm -hmm. I would say. But it does not have to be emotionally intense. We've played games like Thank Goodness You're Here, which was very lighthearted and still offered some great discussion. Um, we can think about games in terms of their systems and like what can we talk about in terms of the way the game was designed. So don't feel like you have to pick um, narratively strong conversation starters. You can also think about what are games that inspire you with their design and like what you would like to talk about there. Um, any other considerations you wanted to highlight, Joel? I think just uh, one of the things that I really appreciated about this year is we got some older games that uh, I had totally missed when they came out. And so uh, if you are thinking of a game, you're like, hey, I'm not sure because maybe it's you know older in some way, don't let that hold you back. Uh, we love to... Uh, we love to re-explore and play games that maybe we did play once or maybe haven't played and just totally missed. Uh, mm -hmm. So don't feel constrained by that. Um, yeah. And of course, you know, since the community is going to be part of the vote, like it's not, the, the, the weight is not all on your shoulders. Uh, if yeah. you have an idea, throw something out there. We want to, we want to hear and hear what you like. Yeah, absolutely. I think honestly, when in doubt, um, <laughs> throw it out i don't know <laughs> just trying to think of a slow throw it out we'll in, in a good way like in, in a, a good way to like, us. Throw, throw it out to over. us throw yeah. it over and out to <laughs> here um but yeah i think that's a really good point we don't want to be a, a community that only plays the newest games um because also i think it is like joel said really important to revisit stuff that we maybe haven't explored within the fresh eyes that we have now i think some of the really interesting conversations we had like with night in the woods for example was it was a game that really resonated when it came out how does it feel now to have mm -hmm. played it um so yeah definitely just recommend recommend nominate you know share the games that you would like um in any capacity. I also wanted to highlight, we do rank choice voting. So your nominations, um, we're not going to force you to vote like against playing for mm -hmm. a game, for right. example. We are setting up this system in a way that we hope mirrors how voting should be, where you're voting for the things that you like. Um, and then hopefully doing that, we come up with a list that everyone is excited about for the next year. Basically, as we go into election state uh, election <sighs> season here in the states, uh, the geeks and grounds voting system is better than uh, what we have as a nation. So uh, we are the change <laughs> we hope to see in the world. <laughs> exactly. Um, and again, a huge shout out to uh, Josh over at Intelligame because I know he also does this with his community um, and inspired 
you know, this change here or not change, but it inspired that system that we've structured this since the beginning, that this has always been ranked choice voting because, um, yeah, I saw Josh do it and I was like, that's a great idea. I'm going to take it. <laughs> um, so kudos to Josh for, for being the person who initiated that here. Um, however, however tangentially and however <laughs> steely I made it. <laughs> I'm a teacher. It's a big yeah. borrow and steal thing. The um, best teachers are thieves. That's what I was always told. Exactly. So yeah, send in those nominations. Do so via email. Just respond to the newsletter. You don't even have to say much. You can just say the game title. You also could say hi if you'd like. That would be nice. But yeah, yeah game title is good. Um, yeah. And you can also nominate games in Discord. So I will set up a thread for nominations. In that, you can put as much detail or as little detail as you would like. Um, yeah, no pressure. So want to make this as low lift yeah. for everyone as possible. And if Gex Enter the Gecko on N64 happens to get submitted a hundred times uh, by a bot, I mean, who's <laughs> who knows where that's coming from? Uh, uh, any other housekeeping for us today, Jenny? Um, I think the last one is that our hangout for October is happening on the 26th, which is a Saturday at 3 p.m. Pacific in Discord. We're going to primarily be talking about Signalis, but of course... We've been talking next best. So if there are any next best demo recommendations or thoughts, we'll probably also squeeze those in as well. So definitely come hang out if you're free. Come hang out and uh, blow off some steam with us. <gasps> hey. Hey. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. Bye. Bye. The Geeks and Grounds podcast is produced and edited by me, Jenny Windham. The logo is designed by Lee Thomas, and today's theme song is from the Keep Driving demo. In addition to finding episodes across YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts, you can hang with us on Instagram and Blue Sky at Geeks and Grounds and reach out to us with questions, comments, thoughts, or feedback via our website at geeksandgrounds.com. Thanks again for listening.